first of all, I want to nerd out with you about Doug Jones. I've been yeah. watching his films for years. On set, the prosthetics, how did it look? How did the eyes work? How were you actually moving the gills? Can you talk just briefly on how yeah, you set that up? Sure. I mean, we, we took three years to create and design the suit. Uh, we, it's all physical. We have digital retouching for the blinking and micro gestures, but it's an invisible technique. What we did is we had mechanized the gills and all the servos are in the back, <laughs> in the little uh, structure in the back, and they really move. And the eyes are uh, almost jewel-like. It takes weeks to create because you layer them and you sculpt them, you layer them in acrylic, but you paint every layer. And you need to let it dry and cure because otherwise the layers separate. And, and, and you see them and it looks like a living opal. They have opalescence, they have blues, grays, film, you know, they have iridescence, magical. And don't you actually do creature vocals? For yes. Some, yeah. I, I sat through the credits, I was like listening to the music and I'm yeah. like, wait, Del Toro's name came up on creature vocals. Yeah, what, yeah. Do you go into a studio and just do the vocals yourself? Yes. What, like what, do you, what sounds did you make? I, I did all the creature breathing, uh, uh, all the agony, you know, all the creature. That's having, you in the yeah, movie? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, the sound designer did all the chirpy <laughs> stuff. And then I go and do a little, uh, uh, like little uh, fish sounds. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. Now, I, was I, I, do, I do that in every movie. I know. I've, been, I've known that. For, it's funny because I, was, I, I didn't know that you specifically did those sounds specifically for yeah. Doug Jones' character here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but can you talk about this dry for wet thing? I'm like blown away by the old school classic techniques yeah. you used here. This is, a, this is a relatively small budget. It looks like yeah. a $100 million film. Yeah, we did 19.5. And what we did is we knew that the opening scene is such an operatic theatrical scene. It's one shot, right? One shot. And we needed to make you feel you were underwater. So what we use is a very old theatrical technique called dry for wet. We fill the stage with smoke. We shoot at a high speed. Uh, we put everything on wires, actors, props, furniture. Everything is on wires. And then uh, you shoot it with uh, fans, hitting the clothes and the fabric. So it moves like it's underwater. And it looks like it's underwater. And then the actors pantomime that they're underwater, and you add bubbles digitally at the very end. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Now, one thing I love about this film is that Green and Teal play a leading character in this movie. Yeah. Shannon's ca uh, candy is uh, green, green yeah. the soap's green, the yeah. walls are the green. Pie. His, the pie. The key lime pie, yeah, the, the, yeah. the refrigerator yeah. shot, yeah, yeah. his car is teal. Yeah. Can you talk about what Green meant for you as a character? Because it plays a leading character it just is. like the cinematography does in the well, score. Well, the idea is to, Green is the future. And this mm. is a time, 1962, where America is obsessed with the future, and in comes this creature that is an elemental god. It's not an animal. It's an elemental god from a river that represents the most ancient holy past for another culture, and is being tortured and studied and prodded uh, by a, a character particularly that doesn't see it for the divine and beautiful thing it is. Now, I could possibly have missed one or two of these, but the only wipe I saw in the film of an edit was when Stahlberg goes to grab those, the map. Um, and you wipe to him. The, Can you talk about, the, was that the only wipe you used in the movie, and what, why yeah. was it? Why did you want to use a wipe there? I thought it was a really cool technique, but it, it, I was like, that's really cool. Okay. Well, what, what, what I wanted, what, he, he grabs a cigarette and lowers his hand, and the wipe goes with his hand. Oh, and it was, it's nice because it's an old movie technique that a lot of people don't use anymore. Yeah. But I thought it was really, really, the movie, it's tried to be shot like a musical, but it's also tried to be shot like a classical movie. So, you know, uh, it, we wanted to, the look to be luscious, lavish, colorful, and some of the transitions and some of the camera work uh, reminds you of movies from the 40s, 50s. You know? It was cool. There's great scenes where obviously you're doing the um, incredible sign language. I know you mm -hmm. learned how to do that specifically, mm -hmm. and then your character's translating for her. Mm -hmm. So does that mean both of you fully know how to sign, or were you performing knowing what she was? Did you learn that as well? Yeah, we, we, yeah. we, I, we, I learned all of the dialogue in our scenes, her mm -hmm. dialogue and my dialogue, mm -hmm. so that I could understand what she was actually saying, and I wouldn't, you don't want to go too fast, you yeah. know, because, yeah. You know, people who know sign language would know that, well, she hasn't said that yet, yeah. you interpreted it. So oh, you want to no. be at her pace. Yeah, and that's, you, it is so much, it's so complicated and, and detailed in that way that you, you have to do that, you have to really do it justice. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, her own sign language is not contemporary sign language, it's of the time, and how would she have learned it? Yeah. it maybe, I talked to Guillermo, maybe it was a book that she mm -hmm. had, there was a huge tome that they got for me that was a 1960s sort of thing that maybe she sort of spliced it together and yeah. 
creating her own language and way of speaking within that. Mm. And you want to um, honor that and honor the ASL community, but she's not deaf. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so you sort of learn it, you, you learn as much as you could, and I tried to worked with a deaf, um, two deaf uh, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, tutors, mm-hmm. um, one in LA when I was here um, months before because mm-hmm. I was so worried, <laughs> I wanted there's so much to learn. Mm-hmm. And you, you're you always aware, you think oh, it's like learning a language. Am I giving myself away? Do I have an accent, mm-hmm. as it were? And um, uh, see, so I just wanted to make them proud yeah. and also really fulfill what the the film needs and I wanted to learn it as best I could Mm -hmm. and then forget it so I wasn't worried about it in the scene Mm -hmm. but you Mm -hmm. can't ever it's you have to it's actually really nice to have something technical to do like that especially at those really emotive moments Mm -hmm. where it it was just a real it was like having a prop Mm -hmm. and something to focus on and, and direct all that passion and energy and that scene with Giles it's so love that scene oh, yeah. okay. oh I was crying yeah. yeah I'm curious just what Doug looked like on set for you when you were when you were in scenes with him how much of him was practical we spoke earlier about the mm-hmm. 90% but like what did it feel like I'm just wondering what it was like for you uh, to be in a scene with him well extraordinary and I only I never saw Doug you know it, that's his transform he's trans he can transform himself Mm-hmm. And he's an extraordinary actor, and this huge heart resonates out of him, and the cre- and that's all that. When I'm in the scene, I was in the scene, and in scene with with the creature, mm-hmm. and this extraordinary godlike creature that was so easy to fall in love with. And I never saw. I saw the way the creature moves. I wasn't. I wasn't aware. I didn't, didn't even think of Doug until, of course, the scene afterwards or preceding it, and you're sort of hanging on to each other and going, is it going okay, is it going to be okay? <laughs> um, especially for, you know, the more intimate scenes and and how, you know, it's like nothing else we'd ever done. And Doug is a beautiful soul. Oh, He's yeah. just an extraordinary human being. So yeah. bright, so eloquent, and and this amazing sort of poetical, lovely way he moved was yeah. just mm. stunning. I need to nerd out with you about the prosthetics because I'm so blown away by everything that Guillermo del Toro did with this movie. I'm wondering what actually was practical. Was there any CG? Did the eyes actually operate the way they did? Can you talk specifically about what the suit looked like on set? Right. Uh, this was a combination of suit and makeup. Suits you slip into and zip up the back, makeups are glued to you. This is a combination of both. So uh, the, the top part was, was a makeup glued onto me with some mechanical bits thrown in. The gills were uh, mechanically operated by puppeteers offset with, what? with servos operating them. The <laughs> eyes were, uh, were on the mask, but, uh, but then were CG enhanced later in post-production that made them move and blink and, and, all, and, and articulate. So like a scene where you go like, like, and it, like, like flaps. Like, yeah, so, so there, they might have added some CG enhancements to make them do something extraordinary. And then also, uh, you know, and, and help the, the, the eyes and ex- the face express on the top part of it. But I was glued in here and I don't let myself. So. Oh my God. And there's a really great scene where you're in the bathroom with him. And, yes. and I'm just curious <laughs> what that was like to actually see him in that suit. I mean, obviously, you, Doug, you disappear in the role. So what was that like for you to see him like that? Um, well, I'll tell you exactly what it was like. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is good. So I was sitting there and before we said action and I saw Doug in a rubber suit sitting in the bathtub kind of, I thought man this movie doesn't have a chance <laughs> <laughs> and then they said action and he changed he gets his, his posture changed just something a little bit and it was like oh okay I think we got something here oh my God. so it, it was uh, it was fun it was amazing <laughs> and but you know I mean Please give me a rubber suit any day. (laughs) (laughs) The worst thing, you know, he's entombed in this. It's not like, I mean, it's like being buried alive. Mm. It's what it is. Mm. You are totally covered except for your eyes and your mouth. How did you use, like, the bathroom and eat? Okay. I don't want to get uh, specific. No, no, no but, but seriously. Yeah. I was, I was also glued into webbed fingered hands, so they had to unglue one of those hands at lunchtime. That's the only break I got with my to have a free hand. 
and that's I had a, a, a front flap for bathrooming, but I did not have a back flap. <laughs> So that, that means that you have to take care of things ahead of time. It, oh. Is this a disgusting conversation? That's I, an amazing I, I hope answer. No. But no, but it, I'm just curious but how it's that true, works. But it's true. Yeah, but I had the same thing. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, yeah. You know, there, there's a line that you recurrently say throughout the film where you say, this is some of my best work. Yeah, right. And I love that because, and one thing I love about this movie specifically was this Guillermo del Toro's use of the color green and teal. Mm. The soap was green. Yeah. Uh, the candy Michael Shannon chewed was green. But what was it about that line? What, can you give me a backstory as to why that character, because he kept saying that over and over, and it was a really interesting line. I, I felt his pain. I felt what he was going through. I wanted him to succeed. But can you talk about that line specifically? Yeah, because he's an artist. And, um, you know, he's an artist alone with nobody to look, look at his work or to give him positive feedback. He's getting fired from the... I mean, it's, it's ego. It's... it's mm -hmm. Don't you think it's it's like how do you get a compliment by saying I think it's some of my best work, you know? Um, it's it's and he's living in a dream world. Too. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, he thinks the pie guy's in love with him. You know, it's like, it's like I love that scene yeah, so much. But, it, but it's it's you know, I mean, it's the need for some kind of connection. I think yeah. it's a, like you know, don't don't you know, it's pretty. What I say, it's good even for shit. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah. Doug, I have to nerd out. The dry for wet stuff is blowing my mind. This is old school filmmaking. Can you mm -hmm. talk about specifically uh, what what scenes would I have seen the dry for wet stuff and actually what scenes did you do underwater? And also, is it true that Del Toro really did vocal effects or uh, vocal sounds for the character? He often does do fo vocal sounds for, for characters. He'll, he'll throw in like a <laughs> later. And so, so yeah, so my, my, my sound had some, had some, some some vocal effects and some some sound design as well. So, cool. uh, so uh, sounds that a human can't make uh, came were coming out of me. <laughs> uh, dry for wet. Yes, we shot we shot some uh, with that, uh, right? like that poster right there. That's yes. actually dry for wet. That's dry for wet. Tell we, me how that works. Hip harnesses, wires to the ceiling. Uh, both of us suspended in the middle of a huge sound stage. Some some smoke filled uh, and lighting effects. And then after, and then in post production, they can throw the bubbles in. They can make the hair float a little bit more. But he had fans going on us as well, so that her, so that her clothing would uh, would ruffle and her hair might ruffle a bit. So to give the the CG some some enhancement, to, some some starting place. Uh, then the, we saw us in the bathroom, the flooded bathroom. That's real water. Real water. Yeah, we were we were holding our breath <laughs> and hoping we don't die during the take. Oh uh, my God. And also when it was in my cylinder, my glass cylinder in the, in the lab, that was also a dry cylinder with, with some smoke in there and me on a teeter-totter going up and down like, I'm floating, I'm really <laughs> in water, you guys. <laughs> right. That's amazing. Um, one of the things I love about Del Toro's in this film is the idea of the use of the color green and teal. You go into the bathroom, the soap's green, your candy's green. I was yeah. just curious about the candy part of your character. Was that something that was written in the script originally? Did you add that? And can you talk about the idea of why he chews the candy the way he does? It's interesting. No, the candy was very much in the script. It was uh, it was Guillermo's idea. And um, yeah, it, it, it's even referred to, I think, uh, at the last scene I have with Hofsteller, um, that you can tell what I'm thinking based on when you uh, bite how it. I'm treating my candy. <laughs> you know, if I'm just sucking on it or if I bite it or, um, yeah, I, it was, it was, it was, I was always constantly trying to figure out, because the candy was written in the script, but it wasn't necessarily written in uh, to as many scenes as I, as I liked. So I was, I was always going over to Guillermo and saying, how about now? Could I have some candy now? It's like, but didn't you have the candy in the last, and I'm like, yeah, but maybe we should have it, we have it in this scene too. And Sometimes he agreed, and sometimes he didn't. But that was one of our main, our main dialogues back and forth. Was, but is it time for a piece of candy? <laughs> it became part of the character. And one of the things I think is interesting about this movie is I was reading a quote from Del Toro that this character he wrote for you was a bit autobiographical in the sense that when he was writing it, he was thinking about his time and learning about the movie business and the things yeah. that. So can, you, can you speak on that? Did you guys talk about what that meant for him as a as a person coming into the movie business and how this character kind of reflected that? feeling he had when he kind of learned people could be ab abandon you and things like that. Well, yeah, I mean, no matter how uh, much you've accomplished or how, you know, quote unquote, powerful you seem to be, there's always somebody above you, mm. you know, and you, I, that's one of the things I love about uh, Strickland in this movie is seeing him, because most of the time you see him controlling things, but uh, when he's with the general, he's uh, subordinate. So yeah. it's great to have that 
see that reversal. I, I think that scene turned out pretty good. Oh yeah, it's a really, really yeah, good yeah. scene. Um, one of the things you say, there's a one scene that you're in the bathroom, you talk about, and kind of going back to the idea of, he talks about how he chews his candy, but you also mentioned that someone uses the bathroom, if they wash their hands twice, that's a judgment on their character. <laughs> I thought that was a really interesting line. I was wondering if you could just speak on that specifically, like if he washes his hand, like what, what was he talking about? It was a really interesting line. I have to say that the way I, I and I don't want to, well, I'm reluctant to, I want people to be able to interpret it for themselves. All I can say is that I think he's very much just kind of screwing with those women <laughs> in that moment. He's yeah. enjoying the fact that he's alone in the bathroom with two women. It's just another example of like what we're seeing nowadays of men, you know, enjoying being in situations where they're um, making women uncomfortable. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting scene, really. And yeah, I was just—I yeah. I just thought he had little interesting tidbits of dialogue about certain things. Yeah, I—I I, I don't know. I don't want to say because I, I want people to be able to, to interpret it for themselves. But you know, one thing I was talking to Octavia about just now is that you do have some lines of dialogue that are pretty brutal towards the characters, and you say some pretty mean things. But there's some interesting element about your character where he is—you feel bad for him in certain aspects. And I, I don't—I wouldn't consider him just a quote-unquote villain. He was a human person who was dealing with things, as you mentioned, the scene with the, the general and being a kind of a subordinate. But can you talk about when you film a scene and you have to say something like that's really harsh towards a person and the camera cuts, do you find yourself kind of wanting to apologize? <laughs> I, I'm wondering how that happens. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, is uh, we all know what we signed up for. I mean, we read the script and, you know, Octavia knows I'm gonna say something mean to her eventually. Um, and uh, you just have to trust uh, the the vision of Guillermo, you know, because Guillermo's not a mean person. So if there's something cruel in the script, it's there for a reason. It's just part of telling the story, you know. Yeah. Last question for you: Do any of the characters you've ever played in your career stay with you? Because um, you you get pretty emotional in a lot of the movies you play. I mean, like obviously, Take Shelter, everything you've done over the years, Nine Nine Holmes. This yeah. is an amazing role. When you, as I'm sitting here with you right now, are any of them kind of like still part of you? Oh yeah, I mean they they stay a part of you. Um, I mean not front and center, but uh, it's kind of like I guess it would be like the equivalent of having a photo album from your childhood or something. I noticed particularly in theater, like recently I did a play that um, I had done like five years ago and I did it again. And I hadn't thought about it at all, but uh, over the five years, but uh, I went in and started rehearsing and it just kind of came right back to me. So hmm. there's some closet up here that's where all those suits are hanging, I guess. Man, well, it's fascinating. It was awesome talking to you. Thanks, Thank Kevin. You. All right, so I love this quote so much. And this is a quote from Guillermo del Toro. I'm sure okay. you've heard this already. Oh. When Octavia looks at you, you feel like you are forgiven for your sins. Have you read, have you seen, have you heard that? No. It, Say it, it again. When Octavia looks at you, you feel like you are forgiven for your sins. I love him for that. And, it, and this was in reference to the idea that he casts people a lot on their eyes. Mm. I was wondering if you could just speak on that, what that quote means to you, but also just the idea of, <laughs> like the, he says 50% of his casting really is eyes. I didn't know that. Um, that's so beautiful. Somebody said something about the eyes before you came in, but that right there just Here we go. made it wonderful. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because I was told that I was going to meet uh, Guillermo for like a coffee. It was like a breakfast coffee for 30 minutes. And it turned into a three hour odyssey. Uh, we talked about films, we talked about politics, we talked about antique, I mean, we talked about everything. Mm. So, um, and, and then the last five minutes is when we talked about the film, when we were paying the check. And he said, I wrote this role for you. I'm not gonna tell you anything about it. Just let me know what you think. And of course, as I'm reading it, like I'm 10 pages in and I'm, the very first page is, you know, Eliza's character is dreaming and she's floating. Oh, and I'm thinking, yeah. I don't know how he's going to do this, but I have to be a part of this film. And um, so here we are. Yeah, I think that shot, and I don't know if I'm correct on this, was some, use a te technique called dry for wet. I'm not saying anything. It's so insane how they pull that stuff off. It's unbelievable. I'm not saying anything. It's, it's just so crazy. beautiful, right? Yeah.
But I, I was reading that you actually didn't want to see uh, the asset prior to the scene where you first see the asset in the film. So is the take in the movie your actual first reaction to mm -hmm. it? Can you describe, like, that day you had never seen any drawings of him, you didn't know what he looked like. Talk about that moment and the first time you saw him and the reaction we see on camera. Well, Zelda's a unique person, and I didn't want to cloud Zelda's uh, reality with what I, oh, you know. So and, and because the creature is such a big part of the movie and such a huge reveal and a huge part of Eliza's life, I didn't want to, I mean, I was curious. I was really curious, but I wanted to keep it pure um, oh. So I, I, he, and he's so excited. I got to tell you, he wanted to show us everything. <laughs> Let me I'm show like, you these. And I'm like, no, no, I don't want to see it. And I'm glad I waited mm. because it was phenomenal to see Doug and the way Doug carried himself as the creature. Yeah. It was amazing. And that's the thing that people don't know. That's not CGI. Oh, yeah. 90% of that is the actor mm. bringing that character to life. I think they only did his eyes and his gills even moved. Like it was Remarkable. Yeah, they had a puppeteer off set apparently that was like, yep. it was unbelievable. There's a moment where you're being interviewed by Michael Shannon. And he's at the help. And he says, I'm interviewing the help. help yeah. And I was just wondering, as you were standing there shooting that scene, does your mind go to the movie only because it's such a iconic role? You want, you know, I'm wondering what happens in your head when he says that line. I loved it. I love it. <laughs> I, I, because, you know, but there are a lot of those um, in the film when you, when you watch the footage, you know, when you watch uh, Giles and Eliza, yeah. uh, they it's. It, I love that we get to be the help gets to be a part of his filmography, mm. you know, and and his love letter, I, even if it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it was intentional, but I loved it. I thought it was great.